The linked video explains in detail the fundamentals of cutting and the forces involved at a cutting wedge. The cutting wedge of a chisel is used as an example, where separating forces act perpendicularly to the wedge faces, ultimately causing the material to split. The following applies, the smaller the wedge angle beta, the greater the separating forces, but the less stable the cutting edge becomes. Therefore, depending on the cutting material and the workpiece material, a compromise must always be found between the smallest possible wedge angle and sufficient cutting edge stability. If the cutting wedge is no longer applied perpendicularly to the workpiece surface, but instead guided at a shallow angle as in milling, the workpiece is no longer separated as a whole, but one chip is removed after another. This process, known as machining, reduces the required force, allowing the material removal rate to be increased simultaneously. During machining, the cutting face must not touch the cutting surface of the workpiece. Therefore, this face of the cutting wedge is called the clearance face. If the clearance face and the cutting surface remain in contact for an extended period, enormous frictional forces will occur, resulting in extreme heat generation. Over time, this would destroy both the workpiece and the tool. Therefore, a so-called clearance angle alpha must always exist between the clearance face of the tool and the cutting surface of the workpiece. This angle typically ranges between 6 and 12 degrees. For softer workpiece materials, the clearance angle is somewhat larger due to greater elastic deformation during machining than for harder materials. So note, the clearance angle reduces friction between the tool and the workpiece, thereby preventing excessive tool wear. The side opposite the clearance face, over which the chip is removed, is called the rake face. The angle between the rake face and the perpendicular to the cutting surface is referred to as the rake angle gamma. The rake angle has a significant influence on chip formation. With a large rake angle, the wedge angle is necessarily small, since the clearance angle typically lies between 6 and 12 degrees and is therefore predetermined. Large rake angles result in high separating forces and overall favorable cutting conditions. With a large rake angle, the chip is less strongly deflected, and in continuous cutting processes, such as turning, long chips are usually produced. These are referred to as flow chips. Such flow chips are generally undesirable because they can become entangled in the machine, damage the workpiece, and pose a safety hazard. Flow chips can be avoided on the one hand by using special types of steel known as free-cutting steels, which have an increased content of sulfur and phosphorus. This increases brittleness, resulting in chips that break more easily. On the other hand, Flow chips can also be avoided by using a smaller rake angle. With smaller rake angles, the wedge angle is necessarily larger, and the chips are strongly deflected. Due to this strong deflection, the chips generally break off quickly, resulting in what are known as shear chips. However, because of the intense redirection of the material being removed and the relatively low separating forces caused by the large wedge angle, relatively high cutting forces are required. In principle, the following applies to the specified angles. The sum of the clearance angle, wedge angle, and rake angle is always 90 degrees. Depending on the size of the wedge angle, the rake face can extend beyond the perpendicular to the cutting surface. In this case, the rake angle becomes mathematically negative. This no longer results in a cutting action, but rather a scraping effect. Negative rake angles, and therefore large wedge angles, are used when machining very hard materials. Positive rake angles, on the other hand, have a cutting effect. This is used when machining softer materials. In machining processes with geometrically defined cutting edges, such as turning, drilling, and milling, chips are continuously removed during the manufacturing process. This process is characterized by three types of motion, the cutting motion, the feed motion, and the infeed motion. Milling, drilling, and turning all involve circular cutting motions. While the tool performs the circular movement during milling and drilling, the workpiece performs the circular motion during turning. An important parameter of these circular cutting movements is the speed at which the cutting edges move through the workpiece. This is referred to as the cutting speed VC and always relates to the outermost point of a circular cutting motion. Let us consider as an example the circular motion of a drill whose circumference corresponds to the cutting speed VC. The following will show the relationship between this cutting speed VC the rotational speed n and the diameter d. To do this, we examine one complete revolution of the drill within the time t. This time for one revolution is also referred to as period t. The point on the circumference of the drill thus moves within the period duration a distance s equal to the drill circumference. 
This distance traveled along the circumference corresponds to the circumference of a circle and is given by the product of the constant pi and the drill diameter d. The circumferential speed, and thus the cutting speed vc, is now determined by the quotient of the distance traveled s and the time t required for it. From this, the given formula for calculating the cutting speed as a function of the period duration and the diameter is derived. This formula can also be expressed as follows. At this point, the reciprocal of the period duration can also be interpreted differently. Let us reconsider the meaning of the periodic time. It indicates the time per revolution of a circular motion. If we now take the reciprocal of this period duration, we obtain the inverse statement. The reciprocal no longer indicates the time per revolution, but the revolutions per unit of time. The revolutions per unit of time, for example 200 revolutions per minute, correspond exactly to the concept of rotational speed. Therefore, we can directly interpret the reciprocal of the periodic time as the rotational speed of the spindle n. If we replace the reciprocal of the period duration in the derived formula with the spindle speed, the given relationship between cutting speed, spindle speed, and diameter results. In practice, cutting speeds are usually given in meters per minute. In this case, the diameter must be used in meters and the spindle speed in revolutions per minute. The specified diameter refers to the outer diameter of the tool in milling and drilling, and to the diameter of the workpiece in turning. In practice, however, cutting speeds are not determined based on spindle speed and diameter, rather the cutting speed is ultimately predetermined by the material of the tool and the workpiece. Therefore, tool manufacturers specify appropriate cutting speeds in their datasheets depending on the material to be machined, in order to achieve optimal machining results. By solving the formula for the spindle speed, the value to be set on the machine can be determined for a given cutting speed and specified diameter. Reference values for cutting speeds or spindle speeds can also be found in handbook tables. Hard materials are generally machined at lower cutting speeds than softer materials. When machining without coolant or lubricant, lower cutting speeds must be selected to prevent excessive heat generation and increased tool wear. The actual net time that a tool can be used without regrinding, in other words, the time it spends cutting material, is referred to as tool life. The tool life of milling cutters typically ranges from about 30 to approximately 60 minutes. After this period, the tools need to be resharpened. Before the actual machining process, the amount of material to be removed in one machining operation must first be set on the machine to achieve the desired dimension. This is referred to as the depth of cut AP and indicates the amount in millimeters by which the tool moves once through the workpiece. In turning, the cutting depth corresponds to the reduction of the radius during machining. For this purpose, the cutting tool is fed radially by the corresponding amount before the machining operation. In turning, the depth of cut is therefore applied by the tool. After the depth of cut has been set immediately before the machining operation, the actual machining process takes place with a corresponding feed movement. In turning, the tool performs the linear feed. The feed movement is directed perpendicular to the depth of cut movement. In the feed motion, a distinction is made between feed and feed rate. The feed F is the distance in millimeters by which the tool moves forward in the workpiece during one complete revolution. The feed rate, on the other hand, refers to the speed in millimeters per minute at which the tool feeds into the material. Since the feed indicates the distance the tool moves forward per revolution, and the spindle speed specifies the revolutions per minute, the product of these two values gives the total distance the tool has fed into the workpiece per minute. This corresponds to the feed rate Vf. Let us now take a closer look at the movements in drilling. In this case, the depth of cut or material removal cannot be freely chosen but is already fixed by the diameter of the drill bit. The depth of cut in this case always corresponds to the radius of the drill bit. When the actual drilling process begins, the feed motion is again directed perpendicular to the depth of cut. Here, the feed F represents the distance in millimeters by which the drill moves downward in the axial direction during one revolution, and the feed rate VF is the speed in millimeters per minute at which the drill is fed downward overall. Let us now take a closer look at the movements in milling. In this case, it is not the tool that performs the depth of cut movement, but the workpiece. The entire machine table, along with the workpiece mounted on it, is moved while the spindle axis of the milling cutter essentially remains stationary. In milling, the depth of cut occurs not only in the radial direction, but also in the axial direction. Therefore, a distinction is made between the radial depth of cut AE and the axial depth of cut AP. Now the actual machining process begins. Unlike turning and drilling, 
Milling involves a particular aspect regarding the feed. Since milling cutters have a varying number of teeth, the feed is usually specified per tooth. This is referred to as the feed per tooth FZ. The total feed of the milling cutter per revolution is then calculated as the product of the feed per tooth FZ and the number Z of teeth. Using this total feed F, the feed rate VF can then be determined again with the shown formula. In machining, especially in milling and turning, a distinction can be made between roughing and finishing. Roughing refers to the coarse machining of a workpiece. For this purpose, special roughing cutters are available in milling. The goal of roughing is to remove as much material as possible in the shortest possible time. Therefore, feed rates and depths of cut are chosen high, while cutting speeds are kept low to avoid excessive tool load. However, the high feed rates and deep cuts result in a relatively poor surface finish. Therefore, as a final finishing operation, so-called finishing is used with special finishing cutters. In this process, feed rates and depths of cut are kept low, while cutting speeds are set high. This not only improves the surface quality, but also ensures better compliance with the desired dimensional and geometric accuracy. So note, roughing focuses on high material removal rates, while finishing aims for high surface quality, dimensional accuracy, and geometric precision.